on this Friday night, snowy states of emergency. A monster blizzard blasts Newfoundland and Labrador. This is like a hurricane during a snowstorm. The drastic measures to keep people safe and where this storm is headed next. Financial help on the way for families of Canadian victims of Flight 752. Plus, a rare meeting Canada's foreign minister face-to-face -face with his Iranian counterpart. And who is Patrick Matthews, the Canadian arrested by the FBI? We talked to the Winnipeg journalist who exposed his neo-Nazi connections. And a significant offer for a significant other. I don't like being alone. A billionaire's hopes to make one woman swoon to the moon. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. A monster winter storm is blasting parts of Newfoundland and Labrador tonight. Locals say it's the worst they have seen in years. Heavy snow and hurricane strength winds have prompted states of emergency in a number of communities, including the capital, St. John's. All businesses have been ordered closed, vehicles ordered off the roads, even snow plows have now been pulled from the roads and are on standby for emergencies only. This is how the fierce front looks from above. It is big and it is menacing. The snow has trapped people inside their homes. And all of this happened fast. This time lapse shows a car being almost buried in six hours. Blizzard and wind warnings are in effect for much of the province. There are multiple power outages. Even camera crews have retreated from the streets. Ross Lord on what people are calling a hurricane of a snowstorm. It's a drastic declaration, with snow falling at 10 centimeters an hour and up to 75 centimeters in the forecast, authorities in Newfoundland and Labrador were forced to do something they haven't done in decades. Right now, the city of St. John's is in a state of emergency. So, uh, you know, we're not gonna have any vehicles on the road right now and all businesses are closed. We're asking everybody to stay home. You got a complete whiteout here, uh, you know, very low visibility, if any, and, uh, you know, certainly not a safe, uh, you know, excursion outside of your home right now. The state of emergency forced one taxi company to take its vehicles off the road for the first time in its history. From the look of abandoned roadways, most people stayed inside voluntarily. Some are getting a jump on shoveling to make less work when it's all over. Those who did venture out were stunned by the combination of heavy snow and vicious winds that are already gusting over 100 kilometers an hour. This is a bad one. This is like a a hurricane during a snowstorm, in my opinion. At one point, I didn't think I could make it home, and I, I hit it for home. I it was it was so white around the outside of my vehicle, I couldn't see in front of me, behind me, and I've been covering weather for uh, over 20 years, and this one, by far the worst. St. John's had already received 170 centimeters of snow in the past month. That's more than half its average winter total. Meteorologists say by the time this blizzard ends, it could set records for amounts and or wind speeds. Police say they have officers available for emergencies and the worst might not be over. Wind gusts are forecast to be at their highest this evening, up to 150 kilometers an hour in coastal areas. Ross Lohr, Global News, Halifax. Meteorologist Ross Hull joins me now. Ross, how long is this storm going to last? Donna, this is a massive storm and it is taking its time to move out of Newfoundland. Look at this radar satellite image, the outflow from this system. So it's having a huge impact, a major impact on St. John's. Heavy snow, strong winds, close to 40 centimeters already today. Could see just as much for some areas tonight. And of course, those blizzard conditions with the reduced visibility. This system does start to pull out by tomorrow morning, so good riddance. We've got another system on the way for that very area Monday. Not as intense, but it will be intense snowfall. Southern Manitoba into parts of Ontario and Quebec, where this could be the largest snowfall, the biggest snowfall so far this winter. It's been a pretty tame winter so far. Not the conditions across the prairies this week. Frigid, extreme cold, still a cold one today. Wondering when you're going to see some relief? Well, that cold starts to move out as we head into the weekend. Temperatures above the freezing mark by Sunday into next week across southern Alberta. So mild conditions across the southern prairies. But that onshore flow for the south coast of B.C. will mean some steady rain. And the snow that's already fallen there could melt. The combination of the two could lead to some flooding. Donna. All right, Ross Hull, thank you.
In other news, the Prime Minister has announced families of those who lost loved ones in the downing of Flight 752 will get some financial help. It's not compensation. That's up to Iran to provide, but it is designed to offer short-term help. Abigail Beeman is in Ottawa with the details. Abigail, what is the Canadian government providing to the families? Well, Donna, the Prime Minister is offering $25,000 for each victim. We know there were 57 Canadian citizens on board that plane, but Justin Trudeau also shared there were 29 permanent residents who would be eligible for help, too. That adds up to a little more than $2 million. I've been meeting with families uh, over the past weeks. Um, I have had direct conversations with them on the needs they're facing, everything from bills that are coming in to credit cards that are maxed out to real questions about how uh, to get back to Iran to support their families there or bring people over at a time where air travel is uh, increasingly limited uh, in the region and uh, expensive. The Prime Minister was clear that these are only first steps, saying the families need help now, but that Canada expects Iran to fully compensate them. He says it's too early to say what specifically Canada will call for, but that any money Iran may hand over will go to families and not to reimburse the Canadian government. We also learned from Trudeau that about 20 families want their loved ones buried in Canada, and he expects some of those repatriations to happen in a matter of days. Abigail, Canada's foreign affairs minister had a rare meeting with Iran's foreign minister today. What was the tone of that? What was discussed? Well, Donna, at this in-person meeting, Francois-Philippe Champagne updated his Iranian counterpart on the requests from the five foreign ministers who agreed on a framework of action after they met in London Thursday. Those five requests include full compensation for victims' families and an independent criminal investigation into what happened. Ottawa says Iran has committed to continue cooperating with Canada and the other grieving nations, but there are no specific commitments from Iran in terms of those requests from the working group. Donna? Okay, Abigail Beeman in Ottawa, thanks. Iran is facing intense pressure, including from its own people. Many of those who died were Iranian or dual citizens. Today, the country's supreme leader made a rare appearance at Friday prayers. 80-year-old Ayatollah Khamenei called for national unity and launched into the usual anti-American rhetoric. As Redmond Shannon reports, lots of Iranians want him to step down, and this was his attempt to shore up support. After recent protests against the regime, this was a show of support from those fully behind Ayatollah Khamenei. The Supreme Leader spoke at Tehran's Mosala Mosque for Friday prayers for the first time in eight years. These American clowns, he said, who with lies and utter evil say they stand by the Iranian people. They should see who the Iranian people are. Khamenei referring to US President Donald Trump's recent tweet in Farsi supporting Iran's anti-government protests. On the downing of Flight 752, Khamenei said the West was delighted the tragedy diverted attention away from the US killing of Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani. He also said Britain, France and Germany are just lackeys of the US in their dealings with Iran and the anti-nuclear proliferation deal. Across the border in Afghanistan, a ceremony for the first of its citizens to be repatriated. Ukraine expects all of its 11 victims to be repatriated on Sunday, nine of whom were crew members. Global News understands a ceremony will be held in their honour in the capital, Kyiv. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Vadim Pristaiko said Iran is now ready to hand over the black boxes for analysis and demanded that happen immediately. Pristaiko was among the team of five foreign ministers who agreed on a framework of action at the Canadian High Commission in London on Thursday. He said it won't be enough if Iran only prosecutes the soldier who pressed the button. Everyone involved, he said, must be held to account. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has rejected his prime minister's offer to resign after leaked audio emerged of him saying Zelensky knows nothing about the economy. The prime minister claims the recordings were doctored, but offered his resignation to show respect for the president. Zelensky has called the situation unpleasant, but is allowing the prime minister to, to stay on. He's given investigators two weeks to determine how the audio was leaked, saying it's a matter of national security. 
A new book is providing insight into an extraordinary day in Washington, the day the book claims the American president called his top national security advisors dopes, babies and losers. The book is called A Very Stable Genius. It was written by two Washington Post reporters, and it recounts a meeting in July of 2017 inside a secure room in the Pentagon called The Tank. It claims three top officials, former Defense Secretary and four-star General Jim Mattis, former top economic advisor Gary Cohn, and former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, were concerned about Trump's impulsive decision-making and lack of knowledge of history, geography, U.S. military strategy, and diplomacy. So they put together a tutorial on the basics. According to the Post, Trump became impatient and began to complain. At one point, he apparently questioned why the U.S. couldn't get oil as payment for American troops stationed in the Persian Gulf. He said, we spent $7 trillion. They're ripping us off. And where is the effing oil? On the war in Afghanistan, Trump said to his top military generals, you are all losers. You don't know how to win anymore. He then said, I wouldn't go to war with you people. You're a bunch of dopes and babies. There was, the book claims, a stunned silence in the room. It was immediately after that meeting that Tillerson is reported to have called Trump an effing moron. Tillerson, Mattis and Cohn have all since left the Trump administration. A Saskatchewan man has been found guilty of defrauding people of several thousand dollars that was donated to a humble Broncos GoFundMe campaign. Andre Alexiak was found guilty of fraud and possession of property obtained by crime. He started a Humboldt crowdfunding page shortly after the Broncos bus crash in 2018. 16 people died, 13 others were injured when the team's bus collided with a tractor trailer. Alexiak's GoFundMe page raised just under $3,800. Almost all of it was deposited into his bank account. He testified he gave the money to a woman who knocked on his door soliciting donations for a Broncos charity. A separate official GoFundMe page raised more than $15 million, and that money was given to the victims' families. The state of Virginia is on high alert tonight, coming up the serious steps it's taking before a pro-gun rally. U.S. authorities are expanding their crackdown on a neo-Nazi group that apparently has ties to Canada. Three more people have been arrested, accused of involvement in the white nationalist group known as The Base. Yesterday, a former Canadian Army reservist and two others were arrested by the FBI. It's suspected they too were connected to a neo-Nazi paramilitary group. Authorities believe they were planning to attend a pro-gun rally in Virginia on Monday. And as Jackson Prosco reports, that state's governor is warning there could be violence. Fearing violence, Virginia's capital is on edge, fenced off and under a state of emergency ahead of a pro-gun rally Monday. We're seeing threats of violence. We're seeing threats of armed confrontation and assault on our capital. Thursday, the FBI arrested Patrick Matthews, a former Canadian military reservist, along with two other men. All three are alleged white supremacists and may have discussed traveling to the rally for America's Martin Luther King Day holiday. There's a lot of rhetoric that, get, that these groups use. A lot of it is aspirational. But there's a small minority within this universe of hate that will take action. And that's what the FBI is trying to prevent. Matthews went missing from Manitoba last summer and is alleged to have crossed into the U.S. illegally. In court, prosecutors showed pictures of some of the men at a firing range. They say the suspects belong to a neo-Nazi group called The Base and had amassed hundreds of rounds of ammunition and had built their own assault rifle. Three other men in Georgia with ties to the same group were also arrested. Is it a threat? Absolutely it's a threat. It's every bit as threatening as what ISIS might purport to do in the coming months. Officials in Virginia fear a repeat of the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, where a woman was killed as white nationalists marched on the city in 2017. This time around, new state laws restricting gun ownership have fueled hatred. There's so much tension, the governor has temporarily banned all weapons near the state capitol building, further angering rally organizers. The governor is trying to take away our ability to carry guns. How, how, how ironic is that? How crazy is that? He keeps poking the bear. By arresting people before the event, officials are sending a message about how closely they'll be watching Monday's rally. Fearing civil unrest could play right into the hands of those who seek to cause it. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. 
Coming up, I speak with the reporter who first exposed Patrick Matthews' story. Ryan Thorpe tells me how he infiltrated a white supremacist group. You're watching Global National. Getting inside the world of neo-Nazi paramilitary groups is not for the faint-hearted. So when Winnipeg Free Press reporter Ryan Thorpe began investigating recruitment posters that were spotted in Winnipeg last year, he didn't know where it would lead. Turns out it led to a man who was just arrested by the FBI in the United States. Patrick Matthews disappeared from his home in Beausjour, Manitoba in August of 2019 after police raided his home and seized firearms. He's now in custody in the U.S. It was Ryan Thorpe's reporting that first exposed Matthews and Ryan joins me now from Winnipeg. Ryan, you spent weeks working to infiltrate this group called The Base, and you eventually met Matthews. What was he like? What was he planning? He was, uh, he was, a, he was a strange individual. Uh, when I met him in person in Winnipeg, um, I certainly got the impression that this was someone who took his political views quite seriously. He was openly discussing the possibility of carrying out attacks uh, to perpetrating violence against activists, things like that. So I was uh, incredibly concerned by, by his rhetoric. And then the obvious question was, you know, just how serious was he about the things that he was saying? I think what we saw um, coming out of the U.S. yesterday in terms of the uh, uh, firearms and, and the stockpile of ammunition that he was arrested with, it points clearly that, you know, he was very serious about uh, these professed views. You know, what more do you know about him? He lived in a small town in Manitoba. Do we know how he got involved in this, what his family situation is? Yeah, his family's also from Manitoba. I know he has a brother that is also in the Canadian Army Reserves. Um, in terms of how he got involved with this, he appears to have undergone a process of radicalization over um, several years. He kind of walked me through his, uh, I guess, political trajectory when we met in person, going from something of a, of a libertarian at one point to what he called a, a racial realist, which would essentially just be a racist, until eventually he got to a point where he uh, adopted uh, neo-Nazism and actively began trying to uh, turn other uh, members of the Canadian Army Reserves who he worked with onto neo-Nazism as well. You know, his story would likely not have come to light without your reporting. Does it suggest to you that there are others like him flying under the radar? Yeah, I, I, I think that's safe to say. Uh, the military's own report on this, which was released last year, indicated that over the process of several years there had been 56, uh, I believe, members of the Canadian Armed Forces who had either been tied to expressing extremist views or who were bona fide members of hate groups. Um, now, at the same time that this report was being produced, Matthews was flying under the radar. So we know that they're not uh, entirely aware of just how many folks in the Canadian Armed Forces uh, hold these views views and are active in hate groups. Obviously, this is a, a small, small minority of people we're talking about. It doesn't reflect upon the vast, vast majority of folks who serve in the Canadian Army. Um, but uh, I think it's safe to say that even one extremist in their ranks is uh, too many because we've consistently seen that it only takes one lone actor motivated by these ideologies to cause uh, a lot of violence. Ryan, this guy's been uh, arrested by the FBI. He's in custody in the U.S. now. I know you're continuing to follow the story. Do you have a sense of what happens to him next? Well, he was arraigned in court uh, yesterday. Um, he's facing two separate charges, both of them firearms related. If he is, um, if he's convicted on both counts and sentenced to maximum sentences, he could face up to 20 years in U.S. federal prison. All right. Well, thanks for your reporting on this. Ryan Thorpe from the Winnipeg Free Press. Appreciate talking to you. Fly me to the moon. Let me Next, this bachelor's bid for someone to love to the moon and back. A mystery in the art world has been solved more than two decades after a masterpiece went missing. This painting was found concealed inside the walls of an Italian art gallery. A gardener clearing away ivy discovered it. Experts have confirmed it is the original Portrait of a Lady by Gustav Klimt. The piece went missing from the same gallery in 1997 and police are now working to find out who stole it and whether it ever left the grounds. 
Well, you may have to suspend your disbelief for this next story. A Japanese billionaire is looking for a female life partner. Nothing unusual about that, but here's the thing. He wants to take her on the first SpaceX tourist trip to the moon. And as Mike Drolet reports, he's been busy searching for the right woman. It was only a year ago much of the world was introduced to the first moon tourist. I am from Japan. First impressions are everything, and Yusaku Mizawa, a skateboarding kid with dreams of being a rock star, who ended up as a billionaire fashion entrepreneur, came across as earnest, if not eccentric. I choose to go to the moon. He announced that he hadn't just bought a seat on Elon Musk's yet-to-be-built starship, he bought all of them. And his dream was to invite artists, including painters, musicians, and dancers on the trip, to inspire them to create something beautiful. I don't like being alone. So I want to share these experiences and things with as many people as possible. But a year later, it turns out Mizawa isn't just a billionaire. He's a lonely billionaire. And he's now promised one seat to his life partner, whom he hopes to find through a reality dating show. His criteria? A bright and positive woman who's at least 20 years old and values world peace. 27,722 women ultimately applied. Now, they had to fill out an online form and submit a picture, but they also had to answer some key questions. If you rode in a private jet, where would you go? Are you motivated by Meizawa's money? And how would you react if Meizawa passed wind in front of you? Blame someone else? So there you have it. A trip to the moon is unattainable for most of us. Unless, of course, you're a talented artist or the future life partner of a quirky yet seemingly fun billionaire. Fly me to the moon. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. At least he's got the theme song. That is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Here Canada is Hogs Back Falls in Ottawa. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to us. And thanks for watching. Robin Gill will be here at the Anchor Desk over the weekend. And I will see you back here on Monday. Have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye.